Welcome to Market Update from the Property Podcast, where every month we round up all the stories around property that you need to know about as an investor. There's lots going on. We're talking about property prices, the rental market, mortgages, a lot more besides, and we're making a bit of fun at the Bank of England's expense as well. So let's get into it. Let's start, as we always do, with house prices, because once again, it's something that everyone's talking about. It is, and while other markets are really struggling right now, there's no sign of the property market struggling. Growth continues to be there. Not at the pace it has been, it must be said, but it is still there. So according to Home Track, over the last 12 months, house price growth has been 8.4%. Over the last four weeks versus the five-year average, demand for homes is up 40%. And the market itself over the last month is up by 0.1%. So over the last 12 months, still very strong. The last month, actually not that strong but still growth, which seems to be booking the trend against everything else. It's going to be interesting to see what comes over the next few months. We've talked about the second half of the year being slower than the first half of the year, but not seeing falls. And we talked a lot about that last week where we did our halftime reports on the year so far and look to the year ahead. So if you're interested in our view of what's going to happen to property prices for the next six months, make sure you check last week's episode out. But Rob, we always like to have a recap of the top performing cities in the UK. And it seems Nottingham has got no intention of dropping its number one spot and has seen double digit growth for the last 12 months. Yep, Nottingham continues to do so, so well. Manchester and Liverpool have been strong performers for years. They're still up there as well. Bournemouth has moved into the number two slot, which is interesting as well. That's the first time for a long time that I can remember a city in the south being near the top of that list. But like you said, Rob, prices are still growing, slowing slightly from where they were. And the narrative continues to be that growth will slow. Both Nationwide and Zoopla putting out research in the last month saying that this is what they expect to happen. And that's not surprising for a couple of reasons. Firstly, growth has been so extreme, it's always going to moderate. And secondly, there are, of course, economic reasons why you could see growth slowing down over the next little while. But this kind of idea about how property is going to capitulate at some point, as it's been going on and on and on ever since the pandemic. Initially, of course, when the pandemic became a thing, everyone thought that house prices were going to fall. And then when they didn't, it's just like, oh, well, here's a reason why it hasn't fallen yet, but it will do soon. And it's kind of carried on the whole way through. And Knight Frank has been one of those institutions saying that they believe that property prices will begin to suffer, but they've actually just revised their forecast up. They were saying that price growth over this year was going to be 5%. They're now saying it's going to be 8%. They do, I must point out, revise their forecast quarterly, which is a bit of a blooming cheat if you ask me we do ours annually and hold ourselves to it and then we have to say if we're right or wrong it'd be a lot easier if we got to redo it every few months based on what has happened but in any case rob while i don't disagree that i don't believe that growth will necessarily be as strong as it has been for the first half of the year i'd say that performance still looks like it's going to be stronger than many or most people predicted and the consensus view seems to be that growth will continue just at maybe a slower pace yep and that's how we see it as well but like you say rob it would be great if we could uh revise our predictions every few months and we don't get that privilege but it seems if you're not frank you can and let's see if they're right you know (laughs) they might still get it wrong but we'll see an update for you on the story we covered last week on the podcast which is the bank of england has withdrawn its mortgage affordability stress tests now at the time it was all quite raw news and we didn't know what the implications were well we now know that it doesn't apply to buy to let mortgages yet It applies to normal owner-occupier mortgages. Still a move, and still a move to loosening things and forget some of the lessons that we've learned in the past. Not as dramatic as we thought it might have been. So the removal of that stress test is one indication of something that we've seen play out before, which is when a boom gets going, things get put in place to keep it going and perhaps keep it going for longer than anyone initially expected it could. Of course, as a boom goes on and house prices keep getting higher, especially if they're getting higher relative to wages and everything else of them running ahead, which interestingly at the moment they're not. But as that does happen, you need to find some way of making houses more affordable at a higher price. One way of doing that is for mortgage lengths to increase. And right on cue, there's a report in The Guardian that apparently the government is considering a plan for 50-year mortgages that can actually be passed down generations. So we can take out a mortgage and then leave our kids to pay for it. That sounds pretty good to me. Now, at the moment, that is just being rumoured. 
But if that does happen, then that'll be really interesting because that'll be yet another factor supporting house prices to get even higher. Something else that's a little indicator of the boom considering is the lender, the Halifax, changing its lending criteria so it will now lend up to 95% on new build houses. Now, this is only one lender, but it's a big one. And previously, they'd only gone up to 90% rather than 95% on new builds because they were concerned that new builds might not hold their value so well. Now, they're going to go to 95% like they do for non-new builds. Which to me, Rob, implies a couple of things. Firstly, that they're not as concerned as they were about new builds holding their value. They're not treating them any differently, but also that they're keen to do business. Absolutely. The, all these lenders have had a taste now. The first half of the year was very good for them. Lots of people wanted to borrow money and they make money when people borrow from them. Now, with interest rates rising, they've had to become more competitive. That's right, but it's not surprising because Lenders have had a very good first six months of the year. The market was really kicking on and people wanted to borrow from them. And they've had a taste of that now and they don't want to lose that taste because they like making money, believe it or not. And now interest rates are moving up. People may be a little more hesitant to push forward with borrowing from them for their home or buy to let. So this trend of lenders trying to offer different products or loosening their criteria is not a surprise. And it's also not a surprise to see in the mortgage strategy website a article on average product fees are falling on mortgages as well. So when you take out a mortgage, a lot of the lenders will charge you a product fee. They are falling across the board. Again, that's a sign that they're trying to become more competitive to draw you in. They're having to up their offering. So no surprises that this is happening and that we will not be surprised to see in future months when we cover the news stories on the podcast, that we see more of this. Elsewhere in the rental market, the news is that rents are continuing to rise fast. I'm not sure about this data though, Rob. According to the website home.co.uk, average rents over the last year are up by 18.8%. That can't be right. I do not believe that figure, but I do believe that rents are rising fast because I'm seeing that everywhere that I have alerts set up for. So I do believe that rents are going up, but not by that kind of level. Yes, this article doesn't talk about where they've got the data from for this. So if it's a very small supply of data, then it can be skewed. But what is interesting is it seems to be driven by London more than anywhere else. So rents absolutely are going up across the board in the UK. That is clear to see for anybody who even has a slight interest in the property market. But London seems to be the main driver of this. And then it's no surprise when it links into our next news story that we see this headline but I must admit, I was surprised because I expected it to be a big-ish number, but not this big. But a third of all new homes in London are built to rent. Like London's a big place, right? And a third of the homes that are being built right now are built to rent. That is huge. We've talked about build to rent before and now it's becoming a competitor for the everyday investor. And this is really demonstrating that at some level. Although, Rob, before we went on air, you made a great point, which is to say, well, actually, is it skewed because only 7% across the UK is built to rent stock? So really, the vast majority of the stock in the UK that's built to rent is very much London focused right now. But at some point, you'll have a ripple effect with built to rent. You know, the value won't be there for the institutions in London and they will look more and more to other cities. Manchester and Leeds have seen a lot of built to rent already. And I think that trend will only continue. That's right. It may be skewed by the fact that there's not much in the way of other completions in London. So the figure sounds high. But even if you just take the national figure, 7.2% is not nothing. That's not insignificant. It's creeping up. At some point, it's not going to be too long before it gets to 10%. And it's, it's going to be start making serious inroads. We've been talking about build to rent for years and it's kind of help happening stealthily but it's going to start hitting a point soon where it really is a significant force in the market we actually haven't got this on our list but lloyd's bank uh, over the last couple of weeks have announced that they've just gone and bought another 100 new units that they're going to be renting out and so some of these plans that we've been talking about for the last couple of years about companies announcing big plans with big sounding numbers well they're starting to deliver on those numbers now that build to rent sector though at the moment is 
focusing on the higher end of the market and is not doing anything for tenants who are on benefits. And there's a story in Landlord Zone about 820,000 private rented households that have got a gap between the level of housing benefit that they receive and the level of rent that they have to pay. And this is not a surprise because the government keeps on freezing the level of housing benefit while, as we've just reported, rents are going up. Therefore, that is going to leave a lot of people with a shortfall, which means either they're going to have to make up the difference themselves from some other source of income if they have it, or they're going to be building up arrears and may ultimately find themselves out of a home. So it'll be interesting to see what the government does about this. It frequently does freeze the level of housing benefit because it looks unpopular, the fact that the government is indirectly paying money to landlords. So they'll freeze it, but it does start to cause real negative effects. So it's another story that we'll be keeping an eye on in the months to come. Some good news now on ground rents. The Leasehold Reform Act has finally gone live after it feels like being talked about forever. And one of the big things to come from that is ground rents are no more. Well, no more for new properties moving forward. They still apply to existing properties. So if you have an existing lease arrangement, then you will be paying ground rent and service charges normally. And that you still will continue to pay ground rent. But if you are to purchase a new property, then ground rent is no more, which is great news. It is really good to see. So it's been a long time coming, but it's great to see it finally here. A step in the right direction, it must be said. Also, before we move on, a quick mention about EPCs, Energy Performance Certificates. This sounds monstrously boring. It kind of is, but there may be something relevant behind it. There's new guidance to make EPCs more accurate. So this is the first time in 10 years that the way that EPCs are calculated have changed. And it's supposed to make them more accurate. And it does so in some quite important ways. So, for example, electric heating rather than gas heating now gets you a higher EPC rating, whereas previously it didn't. EPCs have been criticised a lot for being not that helpful and also varying massively between two properties that are basically identical and no one can quite figure out why they're the case. So if they're becoming more accurate, then that's a good thing because they might be moving towards being an actually useful document rather than just a piece of paper that you need to produce by law. It could be something you could actually do something with. That can only be a good thing. Now, if you've been frustrated buying a property say over the last year for how long the transaction has taken you're not alone because actually it seems that it's taking longer for pretty much everyone across the board because the average time that it takes currently to complete on a property transaction takes 150 days so that's from sale agreed to completion date 150 days that's 50 days longer during the same period in 2019 That's a huge, huge increase. So while it may be frustrating, note that you're not alone and this just is the state of the world right now and things are taking longer. But it's important to note that if you haven't put an offer in for a property yet, you want it before Christmas, you will get that offer in soon because it's roughly 150 days away. Very scary to look at it that way. Yes, that is the case. So there are lots of reasons why this is happening, but mortgages are definitely a big part of this and how much of a slow process that is. Conveyancing isn't exactly speedy either, but it seems to be most of the clog is around people who are using mortgages and that's what's slowing things down. Maybe as a cash buyer, you can be more attractive than ever before if you can present the facts that with yourself, it would be a lot quicker than going through somebody who's buying with a mortgage. You can state the data that says that it'll probably take about 150 days. Okay, we're nearly at the end of this market update, but it wouldn't be a market update without me having a pop at the Bank of England. And so for our final story today, this is one that tickled me a little bit. Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, famously... I think it was last month, a couple of months ago, came out and got in a bit of trouble for saying that despite the fact that inflation was really high, people shouldn't be asking for pay increases because if they did ask for pay increases, then that would actually stoke up inflation further. And he understandably came under some criticism for these comments. Now there's a new story saying that staff at the Bank of England are considering going on strike, demanding a major pay rise, even though their own governor said that people shouldn't be doing this. And even though, if you ask me, the thing that caused the inflation was the Bank of England in the first place. So whether they will go on strike or not, I don't know. If they went on strike, anyone would notice. I also don't know, but I just found that quite funny. Oh, the irony of it. The governor of the Bank of England suggesting that people should not be asking for pay rises during an inflationary period is just nuts. The market is the market and you can't control it by making a request. And you'd think the governor of the Bank of England would understand that more than 
anybody. But hey, <laughs> that's who's running the show at the moment. Doesn't make him look good, but he's the boss. And some may say it's no surprise that inflation is out of control if he doesn't understand that simple fact. Maybe a bit harsh, but hey, it's a funny story. So there you go. You're fully caught up. And if you enjoyed this, you really must make sure you're subscribed to The Property Podcast. There's a new episode every week and we do one of these market update roundup episodes every month. All you need to do is search Property Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. We'll see you there.